Welcome back, everybody, to the Thinking Talmudist podcast. We just learned the Talmud here on Kufya Tess Ahmed Bey's 119b. We talked about that those who say Vayichulu, who say those first three verses of the second chapter of Genesis on Friday night, are like partners in creation. And we brought proofs from the verses. And one thing that we mentioned previously many times, that there is no such thing as anonymous sources in the Talmud. The Talmud will always bring you the source. Like over here, the Talmud says, Omar Rava, the Tamer of Yehuda, Rabbi Shoban Levi. Rava said, and some say it was Rabbi Shoban Levi who said this idea. Why is it so important? Because when you want truth, you need to have a verified source. You need to know exactly who the source of that information is. Now, I will tell you that sometimes you'll have a source named Mar. Omar Mar. Mar means master. Who is Omar Mar? Right? Exactly. Say, just tell us that's God. God is the master of the universe, creator of heaven and earth. And when you see the words Omar Mar, that Mar said, it's referring to the Almighty. So now the Talmud is teaching us about preparing for Shabbos, preparing, having our home prepared. We recently said previously that the angels escort home one who says Vayichulu in synagogue and they bless the, uh, the reciter that, and your iniquity will depart and your sin will be atoned for by just by saying, just by reciting those three verses testifying that God is the creator of heaven and earth. So now the Talmud continues and says, Tanya, the Brisa was taught, Rabbi, Rabbi Yossi bar Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yossi, the son of Yehuda, says, Two ministering angels escort a person from the synagogue to his home on the eve of Shabbos. One good angel and one not so good angel, one bad angel. And when he comes home and finds the lamp burning, meaning the Shabbos candles lit, the table set, and his bed is made, meaning the house is organized and clean and ready for the angels, ready for Shabbos. Malach tov omer yihirotzen shtele Shabbos acheres kach. The good angel says, may it be the will of God, that it should be this way next Shabbos as well. But what if, God forbid, and the evil, the, the bad angel has no choice but to say, Amen. Indeed, so should be your will, Hashem. The Imlav, and what if it's not the case? What if the house is not set and the table's not set and the candles aren't lit or the house is a mess? What happens? Malach Ra Omer Yehirotzen Shtehele Shabbos Acheres Kach. The bad angel says, "May it be the will of Hashem that it should be this way for the next Shabbos as well." And the good angel, without uh, without willing to, has to res- to say, "Amen." Malach Tov One Amen Bal Karcho. So the the commentaries explain here that two angels are assigned to a person for every mitzvah that comes his way. One to become his defender, the good angel, in the heavenly court, should he perform the mitzvah, and one to serve as a as a prosecutor, a bad angel, should he fail to perform it. So every time you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, you have these two angels that show up. Hey, I'm here. And if he indeed fulfills that mitzvah, then he, bec- he gets a new... Uh, representative, so to speak, in front of the heavenly court for his mitzvah that he did. If, God forbid, he doesn't do it, if he fails to fulfill that mitzvah, what happens? Now, the prosecuting angel comes and is going to be against them. The performance or non-performance of a mitzvah, however, has ramifications beyond the tally of the particular deed. Performing the mitzvah properly strengthens a person's hand to continue performing the mitzvah and weakens the Yetzirah's resistance to future performances of this mitzvah. You know, we say, mitzvah goreres mitzvah. The Mishnah tells us, avera goreres avera. A mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. It like pulls like a train. It 
pulls another mitzvah behind it, another mitzvah behind it, another mitzvah. It's like each car is another another mitzvah that it's pulling. But God forbid a sin also pulls another sin after it because we're creatures of habit. And if we get into the habit of doing a mitzvah, it pulls another mitzvah behind it and another mitzvah behind it. But if God forbid the opposite, we choose to do something which is not a mitzvah, then it can uh, it can pull a a another sin after it. Thus, the good angel blesses the person that is home be suitably prepared to greet the Shabbos the following week, and even the bad angel is forced to answer Amen. By the same token, failure to perform the mitzvah properly weakens the person's resolve to perform it properly the next time and strengthens the Yetzirah's resistance to it. Thus, if he fails to prepare his house properly, the bad angel wishes the failure on him for the following week, and the good angel is forced to answer Amen. The Talmud now continues. And we're right now in the middle of 119b in Tractate Shabbat. Another teaching concerning the importance of setting one's table for the Shabbos. Amar Rebbe Lazar. Rebbe Lazar said, La'olam yisader adam shulchano be'erev Shabbos. A person should always be sure to set his table Erev Shabbos, on the eve of Shabbos, before Shabbos, even though he needs to eat only the Mount of an Olive, meaning even if a person is satiated when the Shabbos begins, for example, for having eaten earlier a meal to honor a mitzvah. So there are some times we mentioned previously that one should not, so one should avoid eating after noon on Friday so that you come into Shabbos with an appetite. You come hungry. You're excited to eat. But what happens if you had a mitzvah? There are multiple uh, occasions when it is okay to eat after noon in on Friday. Like if you have a mitzvah, if you, someone is uh, concluding a tractate of Talmud, right? It's a big celebration. It's a mitzvah to eat. Uh, if someone makes a bris Friday afternoon, mitzvah to eat. If someone has the sheva brachot, the, the 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 seven days of celebration after a wedding, it's a mitzvah to eat. It's a mitzvah to wash and eat. So you're gonna. So now you don't need to eat much. I'm like, oh, well, I'll just I have a mitzvah to have a meal on Shabbos. I'll have a little piece of challah and uh, and I'll thank Hashem, you know, before and after, and and that's it. I don't need to eat a big meal. Uh-uh, you still set your Shabbos table. It should be so, still set, notwithstanding the fact that you don't need to eat much. I have a custom. Um, I'm very, very uh, cautious about. It's my own thing. It's my own, what we call a mishagas, right? It's my thing. And that is that even when we leave the home, we go, we travel someplace uh, away for Shabbos, I set the Shabbos table. Not, not, all the dishes and everything, but I put out the white tablecloth on all the kitchen table, on the dining room table, because it's Shabbos. It's Shabbos. Notwithstanding that I'm not eating, I'm not going to be in the house even, but Shabbos, the Shabbos queen is going to show up again like it did last week, like she did last week, and she's going to be like, what? No Shabbos table set, right? So I like to set the, set the white tablecloth on the kitchen table, in the dining room table, um, as we do every, every Shabbos. And which, by the way, is the halacha teaches us this, but the Talmud tells us that we may see it here that uh, you should set the table in white, like royalty, right? The queen's table is set in a white tablecloth. So that doesn't mean you can't use like a shades of uh, white, off white, and gray, and you know, as long as it's it's pretty and 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 regal for the Shabbos. A similar teaching regarding the departure of the Shabbos. Omer Rav Chanina, Rav Chanina said, "La'olam yisader adam shulchanu b'motzei Shabbos, alf al pishe eno tzarich elo lechazayis." A person should always be sure to set his table on the night following the Shabbos, even though he needs to eat only the the amount of an olive. Why? Because he ate so much on Shabbos, he's not going to need to eat so much after Shabbos. We'll see what this refers to in one quick moment. Just as people come out to escort the king both on his arrival and his departure from the city, so too it is proper to honor the Shabbos at both its arrival and departure. Anyone here ever heard of a Malava Malka? Malava Malka means the escorting of the queen. 
right? Shabbos is our queen. Shabbos comes in, we're all dressed in our finery, and we uh, prepare our Shabbos table, we have everything set. What's about when the Shabbos leaves? So there's a special meal that we have after Shabbos. It's called the Malava Malka, okay, which is the escorting of the queen. We escort the queen out. Since it is important to honor the Shabbos with a meal on this occasion, one should set his table for it properly with a tablecloth and the other utensils one uses on such occasions. This teaching is the source for the meal known as Malava Malka, literally escorting the queen. Indeed, the author of this ruling, Rabbi Hanina, is the one who made it his particular practice to greet the arrival of the Shabbos by going out to welcome the Shabbos queen. He would go out and he would welcome the Shabbos, the queen. Right? We mentioned this last week, that if the queen... May she rest in peace, right? But, but the queen, if she were coming and, you know, we would all prepare, we would camp out if she was driving down Brazewood, right? We would camp out here to get a view of the queen. So too, the Shabbos queen, we should, we should be prepared, come out early and be ready for the Shabbos. Although the Gemara states that it is proper to eat a meal after the Shabbos, it is not an absolute requirement to do so. Thus, if one does not have enough food for both the Shabbos meals and the Malava Malka, one should use the food for the Shabbos meals because that is a biblical obligation versus the Talmudic teaching here to have the post-Shabbos meal. Having mentioned the importance of honoring the Shabbos with the meal at its departure as well, the Gemara now expands on this topic. Chamen b'motzei Shabbos milugma. Hot water on the night after Shabbos is a remedy. Pas chama b'motzei Shabbos melugma. Hot, freshly baked bread on the night after Shabbos is a remedy. Since it is forbidden to cook on Shabbos, one generally does not have hot water to drink that day. Now today we have urns that are electric urns that you put the water in before Shabbos and it stays hot the whole Shabbos. That's not a problem. It's not a problem to use that on Shabbos. But then, those days, they didn't have such technology. So they, they didn't have hot water. Uh, they had a fire, but you can't put anything back onto that fire. If you take something off the fire, it's off. It doesn't go back on on Shabbos. So, thus, a hot drink and washing with warm water after Shabbos serve as a restorative uh, for a chilled body. Similarly, bread straight out of the oven rejuvenates the body after a whole day of cold food. Again, this is different today uh, because of technology. We have today electricity, and we have hot plates that done properly, done properly. You have to know, we have to learn, learn the laws of how to put things back on the hot plate on Shabbos, what is allowed and what isn't allowed, just as a very basic primer. Um, you're not allowed to put any liquids back on the fire. But you can put solids. So if you have, uh, uh, let's say, schnitzel, or if you have some type of chicken, which doesn't have a liquidy uh, base to it, uh, you can put that back on, not directly on the fire, but you can put it with a, as a, with a barrier, so to speak, um, a blech. You can put that on to get warmed up. Anything that has liquid, like soup, you can't put back on the on the hot plate on Shabbos. Okay, so that's just a very basic. Why? Because ein bishul achar bishul. Something that can be cooked cannot be recooked. You can't. When you cook chicken a second time, you're not changing the consistency of that chicken. When you cook liquids a second time, it's changing the consistency of its very. consistency, its its whole, its essence really gets changed. So the Gemara relates an incident. Rabbi Avo have avdon lei afuke shabbosa igla tilsa. Rabbi Avo would have a third born calf prepared for him on the night after the Shabbos. Have a kul kul yasi. And he would eat from it just the kidney. Ki 
Avimi berei Omarle, when his son Avimi grew up, he said to his father, Why should you waste so much meat? Why are you only eating the kidney? Nishbok Kilyasa Mimale Shabsa. Leave over the kidney from the animal slaughtered on Friday for the Shabbos meal and eat that after Shabbos. Like, why do you slaughter a new animal just to have its kidney after Shabbos? Take the animal from Shabbos, from before Shabbos, and eat its kidney after Shabbos. He says, He says, So the next week, the, they left over a kidney on Friday for the post-Shabbos meal, and a lion came and ate the calf. I don't know what that story is telling us. But the commentary over here says, that is, the lion ate the calf that would have been slaughtered for that meal, but due to Avimi's protest, was not eaten. Thus, the calf was wasted anyway. Since the meal is in honor of the departing of Shabbos, it is proper to honor it with something newly prepared, not with leftovers. Oh, so it was what 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 happened here was that the lion eating this calf that would have been had the sun would have been the the Saturday night meal, the Motzei Shabbos meal. Now the lion ate it, which was a sign from heaven. You see. You should have used that one for honoring the Shabbos queen departing. So there should be something special, something fresh that's eaten after Shabbos. So that would make it four meals. If you remember the beginning of the discussion of all of these things, we were talking about whether or not we should have three meals or four meals. And according to the one who said it was four meals, it's one Friday night, one Shabbos morning, one Shabbos noon, afternoon, and then one after Shabbos. Those are the four meals. Okay. The Gemara moves on to a new topic. I'm Rabbi Shoban Levi. Rabbi Shoban Levi says, this is very important. Whoever responds to the Kaddish by saying, Amen, may his great name be blessed forever and ever with all his might. Someone says it with all their might. Korin lo gazar dino, the evil decree made in judgment against him is torn up. Whatever evil decree. So if a person goes and screams out, you go to synagogue, and everyone sings, Amen Yeheshme Rabba, all gently, and you sing it on top of your lungs, you yell it with every fiber of your being. The heavens tear up the decree, any decree. Why Shinema? Again. There's nothing that's given in the Talmud that doesn't have a source. You must have a source to everything, to everything in the Talmud or anywhere in, in, in Torah. There is no such thing as, well, this is my opinion. Why? Because this is what I think. No, 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 no. There's no such thing. You have to have a source. What's the source to this? Shinamar, as it states, Bifra, Peros, Bisrael, Bisnadev, Ambar Hashem. When calamities are averted in Israel, when the people dedicate themselves, bless Hashem. My time of Bifroa pros, what is the reason that calamities are averted? Mishum de Baruchas Hashem, because the people dedicate themselves to bless Hashem. So when we dedicate ourselves and we answer Amen with all of our strength, with all of our might, what we're doing is we're creating a barrier, not allowing evil decrees to touch us. Another exposition along the same lines. Rabbi Chia Baraba Am Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Chia Baraba said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Afilu yeshbo shemet Even if there is a trace of idolatry in the person who is reciting Amen, he is forgiven as a result of this response. He says Amen Yeshbo Rabba, he's forgiven. Ksiv hacha bifra paraos, for it is written here when paraos are nullified. Ksiv hasam ki parahu, and it's written over there in regard to the sin of the golden calf. And Moses saw the people that they were 
Parua uncovered, meaning they were removed from their sins. Interesting that we mention this. You know, every day, just two things, two quick things on Ashrei. We, there's a special prayer that we recite three times a day. Ashrei Yoshrei Veisecha. We say it once in the beginning, in the middle of, we say it in the middle of Pesuket de Zimra, in the morning prayer, in the songs, in the verses of songs. We say the Ashrei. We say it after the end of, of the Shachras service. And then we say it again in the beginning of Mincha. Why? Talmud says an amazing thing. It says that whoever says Ashrei three times a day will merit to the world to come. You say it three times a day, you're meriting to the world to come. Talmud asks, why? Why do you do you merit the world to come? Because it says a special verse. Poteach et yadecha and this is a verse from Psalms. What's Poteach et Yadecha? Open up your arms. Open up your hands. And God satiates all the wishes of man. Thank you so much. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living being. So anybody who says this three times a day, because of this one verse, and this is chapter 145 in Psalms, chapter 145 in Psalms, whoever says it three times a day is guaranteed a portion of the world to come. Not only a portion, is a ben olam abba, it says. He's a, a child, meaning he's, he's ushered in. What's so great about this? Because this verse tells us something unique. This verse tells us that our reliance is not on ourselves. This verse tells us that our reliance is only on the Almighty. You open your hand. When we open up our hand and we say we have nothing, we, we think, oh, uh, uh, my career my skills, my abilities, my talents, my my brilliance, that's the key to my success. No, 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 no. Open up your hands and see you have nothing. In fact, the Sephardic synagogues, they actually open up their hands like this. They open up their hands with, like we have nothing except for your will, Hashem. God, you give what your will is and we accept that with love three times a day. It's guaranteed, the Talmud says, such a person is going to end up in the right place. He's going to get, he's going to end up in the world to come. But there's another verse here in this chapter 145, which is really unique. And that is the last verse. We will bless God from this time and forever. Hallelujah. What does that mean? We will bless God from this time and forever. So our sages tell us something mer- amazing. You see, what does it mean this time? From this time and forever. We're going to bless God from God from this time. Because this time is referring to this very moment. This very moment is a new beginning, our sages say. And three times a day, we have the opportunity to start anew. Me'ata, from this moment. It's a new person. From this moment, we always see Judaism is such... I have to tell you a story. I, I think I mentioned this actually on the, on that uh, Sukkah round table, but I want, I want to talk about it a little bit more. So I was we went to a trampoline park uh, with the kids the first day of Chol Moed, which is the intermediary day of Sukkot. And... Uh, Kids were very excited and they're jumping. And I had uh, brought a couple of books so I could prepare a class or two. And uh, I'm sitting on the side and a woman comes over to me and she says, are you a rabbi? I said, indeed I am, guilty as charged. And she says to me, well, I'm a devout Christian. Can we talk for a few minutes? And I said, sure. And she said something 
that disturbed me so much. And I told her that I, you know, this is against Jewish theology. This is against Jewish principles. This is against everything Jewish. What did she say? She said, well, we were all born sinners. I said, not in Judaism we weren't. All right? We were not born sinners. That's not true. She says, yes, we were. I said, no, we're not. And we got into this whole, she says, well, I guess we'll have to agree to disagree. I said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree to disagree, right? I em- emphatically, right, believe and know that children, babies are born without sin, absolutely born without sin. So now, the, that's right. Neshama should be tahora. We say this every morning. It's pure. So, so what happens here? It's very important to know this. I believe that this is a scam, what they said, what she said. It's a scam. It's a scam because they're saying that you're a sinner. Is anybody here who didn't sin once? Yeah, we've all sinned. I've, I've made mistakes, right? Oh, so they're going to play on that. You see, you're always a sinner, right? You're always a sinner. Now, what are you going to do to get out of that sin? Oh, you have to believe in our Lord and Savior, right? That's nonsense. This deity can't do anything for us. We make mistakes, that's true. But we don't have to go through an intermediary, through a conduit. Yeah, we make mistakes. We are born pure and we remind ourselves every single day in Judaism that we're still pure. Why? Because Hashem is the one who forgives. Hashem is the one. We don't have to believe in anyone except for the Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And He is the one who we talk to directly. And we pray to Him directly. And seek atonement from him directly without any intermediary. We don't need the Father and we don't need the Son and we don't need the Holy Ghost and we don't need anybody else. We have direct with Hashem, creator of heaven and earth. I mean, the, I mean, to even buy the story, this makes no sense. I'm sorry, but if God forbid my daughter were to come home pregnant one day and she says that it was, you know, some God or, uh, Really? Anybody here would believe their child like that? Yeah, I mean, what's going on? What in the world is going on? And you have a billion people following this or more? I don't understand it. But you can't ask questions. So I hereby, I'm sorry it's on this brand new Thinking Talmudist podcast, but I denounce this 100% emphatically. This is against everything in Judaism. Everything. We believe in one creator who was, is, and will be. Haya hovev He created the world and he created each and every one of us exactly the way he created us. If he created you a boy, you're a boy. And if he created you a girl, you're a girl. And there's nothing you can do to change that. And you can ask Dr. Rosenstock. He will tell you. Right, doctor? You said every single cell in your body is either male or female. And by trying to do those hormone blockers and all those other things is destroying the human being, you said. Correct? There you go. We have our in-house psychiatrist who we follow his, his teachings. Thank you, doctor. So this is, it's, it's deeply troubling. It's deeply troubling. But thank God we have a Torah. We have a Torah to teach us the truth, to show us the way, exactly the way in which Hashem wants us to live. So now the Talmud continues. And the Talmud says, all this started, by the way, with saying, Amen Yehesh Mei Rabbah, with force, with might, with energy, with excitement, with devotion. My grandfather says that in the month of Elul leading up to Rosh Hashanah, just accept on yourself one thing. Concentrate when you say those words. Amen. True. And let's review that again, okay, right? Amen. True, may his great name be blessed forever and ever. Olam ula olme olmaya, forever and ever. If we are able to just focus on that one thing, bringing God into our world, bringing God into our existence. Oh, by the way, so this lady, this conversation continued, and she says, so what do you think the purpose of, of life is? What do you think the purpose? Why did God put you here? I said, God put us here to bring godliness into this world to make ourselves holy, 
to sanctify ourselves and sanctify the world that he created. And she was, it was a way, it was like she was not having it. But, so she's like, oh, I got to take my grandkids home. So bye. <laughs> but um, it was, it was quite a, a lively conversation. It was a respectful one, but it, it's, um, we have to, we have to know what it is that we're here for. We're here to serve Hashem, not as puppets, but to bring God into our lives, into our consciousness and to bring it to the world. You know, we had an, an amazing event yesterday. We had during the days between the first two days of Sukkot and the last two days of Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah is Chol Hamoid, is the intermediary days, which we're in right now. And it's, it was a custom in Jerusalem in the time of the temple that they would have music and they would have singing all throughout the night. It says that whoever didn't see the joy of Simchat Bet Yesheva at the temple didn't see joy in his life. Because the water that they brought, the, 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 the water that they brought was the water from the heavens, so to speak. It was the connection of the heavens and the earth with this water that was poured in the temple on these days. So now we have that custom to do the same. We have music and we dance every night. It's, it's an incredible celebration. So we did one like that. Um, we ran it as part of the Hatzalah of Houston and all of the, Local organizations, all the shuls were all uh, co-sponsored with this event. We had over 1,500 people there yesterday. Men, women, and children. It was at Congregation Beth Rambam last night. It was unbelievable. God willing, next year it will be double the size. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable. But that's an example, I believe, of bringing godliness into this world where you have people from every community coming, participating, being part of this. God willing, next year I'll make sure everyone knows about it better than uh, this year. It was a late marketing for this year, but even though even though it was a late marketing, it was still fifteen hundred people. It was unbelievable, over four thousand hot dogs and burgers. Um, it was unbelievable. But that's bringing godliness into this world. We can do it in many many different ways. By the way, when we do acts of kindness, we're doing it to be godlike, to be an example of what you know. We we talk about this a lot in our Musa classes. Why are we called Adam, Adam, mankind? We know because Adama means earth and man was taken from earth, from the soil. Sages tell us there's another reason because of the word Adame. Adame means to emulate. We are here to emulate God. We're here to be God-like. And when we perform mitzvahs, when we do acts, that are God-like, we're bringing God into this world. We're bringing, that people look at us, they can say, you know, this is an example of what God wants. This is what God expects us to look like and how we should act. Hashem should bless us all. We should merit to be great examples, great representatives, great ambassadors of the Almighty in this world. Another exposition along the same lines, Rabbi Chia Bar Omer Ab Nachman, Rabbi Chia bar said in the name of Rabbi, uh, sorry, uh, Amr Rabbi Yochanan, said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Afilu yeshbo shemet even if he has idolatry, a trace of idolatry to him, he's forgiven, and we brought the verse for that as well. I didn't turn my page. The Gemara now describes the merit of answering just amen. You hear a blessing, someone says a blessing on, on the bagels, on the lunch, on, on pizza, on drink, anything. We're supposed to say a blessing before we eat. When someone answers Amen, what's the merit of the person who answers Amen? Reish Lakish Amar. Amar Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish said, Kola One Amen Bechol Koho. Whoever responds to a blessing by answering Amen with all his might, Poschelo Share Gan Eden. They open up the gates of Gan Eden. Right? The Garden of Eden. The gates are open for him. Shenemar Poschen Sho. The verse says, Open, O gates, and let enter the righteous nation that keeps faith. Shomer Amunim. Al Tikri Shomer Amunim. Ella Shaomrim Amen. Don't read it as Shomer Amunim that keeps his faith, but rather Shaomrim Amen that says Amen. We just re reassign the word, the letters of those words, and it's Sha'omrim Amen. Those who say Amen 
with, with, with force, with energy, with excitement, with exertion. The gates of Gan Eden, of the Garden of Eden, are open for him. The Gemara expounds the meaning of the word Amen. My Amen. What does Amen mean? What is the meaning of the word Amen? Amir Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina says, El Melech Naaman. It means God, trustworthy king. By responding Amen, a person affirms that his belief in God's sovereignty and trustworthiness. For this, for this reason, he deserves to have the gates of the Garden of Eden open for him. Amen means truth. It means confirmed. It means I believe. When a person says amen after a blessing, what he's doing is he's saying, yes, I affirm. And Hashem should bless us all. Next week, God willing, we'll continue. Hashem should bless us all that we should uh, always merit to have the Garden of Eden open before for us and to have the gates of heaven open before us but to use this world, this world is the only place we can merit those incredible blessings. This world is the, is, this is the playground. This is the playground where we can get things done. We can do mitzvahs here. We can learn Torah here. We can't do it once we're done. Once we check out and God takes back our soul, we can't give charity anymore. We can't do mitzvahs. We can't put on film. We can't light Shabbos candles. We can't do anything after we're checked out. When God takes back our soul, it's all over. The time that we have here, and you're all young, young people, you have, we have the opportunity every single day to do a mitzvah. We have, we have, even just reciting amen for a blessing opens up the gates of heaven. It's just three letters. Amen. Aleph mem nun. You have the opportunity to open up all the gates. Hashem should bless us. Have an amazing Shabbos, my dear friends. Thank you. Amen. Amen.